Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Elko, and I'm the head of the market specialist team in Hong Kong for Bloomberg. Um, joining me today, we have Alex uh, Savanek, Savanek, sorry for butchering that, um, the CEO and co-founder of Nansen. Alex, um, so why don't we kick off the conversation since we only have 30 minutes and tell us briefly about Nansen, kind of what inspired you to start the company and kind of um, what's your core business? Sure, absolutely. Great to be here. Um, so we started Nansen because we realized that um, there was a gap in the market for investors uh, to understand what's actually happening on chain. Uh, the thing that's unique about crypto and, and the blockchain space versus the traditional finance space, the way I see it, is that you have um, lots of transparency through on-chain activity, but you didn't really have very good tools to access what's happening in real time uh, when we started out. But the closest thing you had was basically compliance and anti-money laundering type tools that were used by law enforcement um, and so on. But we figured that the kind of man in the arena or the woman in the arena uh, should also have access to these tools themselves. So that was kind of the, the gap in the market. And then in parallel to that, we also realized that with you know our backgrounds in data as uh, the three co-founders of Nansen, we could have an edge in trying to figure out um, who are the people and entities behind all the addresses on chain. So that's kind of a, a really interesting and difficult challenge from a technological and data perspective. So putting these two things together, there was a market need, and then we saw that we could bring uh, a new type of product to market. Uh, that's kind of how we started. And the focus initially was on in investors. That is still the core market that we, we serve, trying to help people basically discover new assets, perform due diligence, and overall grow and defend their portfolios. But we've since also expanded into helping new chains that come to market and also enterprises like large exchanges. You know, Think of Coinbase and Circle and names like that who uh, often want to better understand what's happening on chain. So we've kind of grown over the last four years to, to increase our, our surface area a little bit and help lots of different types of customers. So of course, data acquisition is probably the most important thing when you're starting a data and analytics company. Um, but as you start to gather that data and put it into a uh, manipulatable framework, um, then you start to think about how you can run analytics on that. So Nansen's got three core businesses on analytics, the portfolio management and research. Um, how do you think about uh, how you divvy up those businesses? And I guess, um, what kind of player type do you see taking advantage of those three areas? Yeah, so I think of I think of it actually a little bit more in terms of the different customer segments that we have, and the acronym we use internally is basically ICE, I C E, so investors, chains, and enterprises. And so um, I think for all of these segments, we are effectively you know helping them with with analytics, uh, especially with the investors, we're helping them with portfolio tracking as well, and then to some extent also on research. But I would say analytics is probably the core thing that we're uniquely good at. Uh, and so when it comes to investors, uh, you know, their overall goal is to grow their portfolios, right? So that comes back to those things I said earlier, where you're trying to help them discover new assets, perform due diligence, and then also defend their portfolios by getting alerts when you have big uh, events that are happening on chain. Um, for chains, this is kind of an interesting segment that is unique to crypto, but uh, you know, many of you will know that there are actually lots of different chains out there in the world at this point. You have lots of different layer ones. You have lots of layer twos now and even layer threes in the Ethereum ecosystem. And so increasingly, we've also been helping chains go to market more from kind of the, the supply side almost to help them be more transparent and to make sure that when a chain launches, people can actually track what's happening on their chain. So this is a really interesting segment for us that we focused more and more on. Um, and so, um, and then the final one is is enterprise, which consists about, uh, it's about 10% of our revenues overall. So it's relatively small uh, in total, but that's where, you know, you're looking more at how can enterprises like large exchanges, stablecoin issuers, et cetera, get smarter uh, in terms of using on-chain data. For example, if you're an exchange, you should probably know uh, if someone is depositing ten thousand dollars into their account, is this coming from? Is is that the only ten thousand dollars they have, or does it actually come out of a portfolio of ten million dollars or a hundred million dollars? 
and you could be actually winning a much larger share of that wallet. So trying to help exchanges, for example, get smarter um, with their use of on-chain data and analytics, uh, you know, that's that's kind of what we focus on. So I would say analytics out of the areas you mentioned is probably our core focus, but we do have uh, portfolio tracking that's coming to Nonsen 2 in Q3. Um, it's been a separate product historically. Now it's merging with Nonsen 2, which maybe we'll talk a bit more about in a second. And then the research portal also is available to our professional customers, mostly investors and funds who, who look at that. Yeah. Speaking of professional customers, um, so Nansen, of course, is uh, well known as a crypto first company. Um, how has that client profile changed over the years? And when you when you define the professional investor customer, how do you look at that and define that? Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because when crypto was not in a very good place, let's say, you know, late 2022 and parts of 2023, um, you know, we were a little bit challenged on this focus uh, on crypto natives, right? Hey, is this the time to actually go out and go after other customer segments? Because this is a market that frankly has been shrinking for, for a while, right? Uh, with exchanges collapsing, with funds, you know, blowing up and so on and so forth. But we've basically, you know, um, we've stayed the course and our philosophy is that if we can dominate the crypto native segment, then when the more crypto curious segments come in, uh, they're going to be asking the crypto natives, where do you get your information? And their answer is going to be nonsense. And so that's kind of the overall strategy and philosophy. Um, it's not always easy because crypto markets go up and down. But I think it is the right approach. Uh, and then you just have to take a long-term view and you know, have confidence in uh, the fact that crypto is ultimately the future of finance. Mm. And from what I understand now, you're building uh, the next version of Nansen, or you know, we might call Nansen 2. Um, why don't you just give us the high-level overview on what kind of evolution the product's making? Yeah, so it's interesting with Nansen 2 because the, the need from you know, the organizational uh, perspective originally came from the fact that the tech stack was getting too slow. And while we were onboarding lots of new engineers, they had issues be, uh, actually being productive and shipping code on it. So the need came from like uh, wanting to upgrade the tech. And then at the same time, we figured if we're going to do all this work of replacing all the technology, we should probably also, you know, make sure that users can benefit from that too, not just the developers. And so we we sort of launched what we called internally the forward expedition that was named after the ship of Fritjof Nansen that we also named our company after. Uh, and so we wanted to get out of this, you know, being stuck in ice uh, and, and move forward. And so we took this approach of trying to get uh, a new version of Nansen to market fast, knowing that the product is not going to be finished when we launch it. So in November, uh, in um, actually in September, if you go back uh, last year, we launched uh, a first version of Nonsen 2 that was quite minimal and it would live in parallel with Nonsen 1. And then we've basically been improving Nonsen 2 over time and also measuring the user engagement of the two different products in parallel. But some of the benefits you see, uh, you know, if you're using Nonsen 2 and, and you come from the Nonsen 1 world is that number one, it is way faster. It loads basically a hundred times faster because of the upgrades we've made to the tech. And that's actually a big component in the overall user experience because our users, they want to, you know, sleuth on chain. They want to go around and find interesting signals and insights. And it's really important that the user experience is very fluid. So this load time improvement actually materially impacts the user experience in a positive way. The second part is that we make a lot more use of AI in the product in many different ways. And we're actually rolling out more AI features as we go. But for example, we have this feature called Signals, which actually uh, highlights sort of anomalies on chain, uh, interesting things that are statistically you know, out of the norm. For example, here's a token that is suddenly being deposited very rapidly to an exchange. Or you know, here's another token that addresses on chain that we classify as smart money are now buying a lot a lot of those types of signals um, are now part of the product and and that leads me to the third part which is that the product is also a lot more personalized so these signals 
they're not actually the same for every user. They are tailored based on your uh, portfolio, based on tokens you care about, based on addresses you might have added to your watch list. So the whole experience kind of gives you this feeling of you're seeing something on chain that maybe no one's ever seen before. And that gives you an edge and that generates alpha. So uh, so those are those are probably the three things I would I would highlight. Like number one, the speed is much, much, it's much faster as a product. Number two, it makes use of AI much more aggressively in a good way. And then number three, it's much more personalized, which overall just makes it a better user experience. Yeah, I think so the topic of AI across all of fintech is definitely one that's been coming up very frequently as of late. Um, I think that the majority of the market and it's, you know, because it's such a great product assumes that AI is generative AI, but AI is a very broad, broad brush that you can paint across the technology industry. What kind of AI is Nansen leveraging? So um, are you leveraging, say, generative AI to help your coders code faster and become more productive? And then are you using what other kind of AI systems are you using to help create the kind of identify these signals? Yeah, I love this topic. We could probably spend hours talking about this. I'll try to keep it short, though. Uh, so, do all the time here, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, so there's basically two parts there. Like one is how do we how do we use AI in the organization to drive productivity? These are I'm actually gonna do a talk at a conference here in Singapore at Super AI about this topic soon. But we've basically set goals on literally just using AI in terms of how many hours the whole company spends on AI in every department. And we measure this on a weekly basis. And we're getting, uh, we're basically pushing each other to make use of AI more in, in all sorts of different ways. But I think um, for the purpose of this conversation, it might make more sense to talk about how we're using AI in the product itself, like how the product gets better and how we innovate on that front using AI. And there are basically three pillars there. And the first one is personalization. So the image that you can have in your mind here is kind of the movie Her, right? And and to me, like the takeaway from the movie Her is you're probably, a customer will never leave your product if they fall in love with the product. Of course, in that movie, it's taken to the extreme where they literally fall in love. And you've probably seen the news about Scarlett Johansson now going after uh, open AI and all that stuff. But personalization is very important. The, the principle here is if we can use AI and machine learning to personalize our product such that it just feels like the product is, is built for you, then we're going to have really high stickiness and retention and people are just going to continue using the product. The second part is what we call fast and fluid interfaces. So this is where, you know, I think AI changes the game and how you interact with, with um, the internet, with information more broadly. And so the obvious examples of this would be that you might use just natural language to ask for something instead of like clicking around on a dashboard. Uh, but there are other interesting examples here. And overall, the idea is that you should be able to just uh, very seamlessly navigate data. And I think that, so the vision here more broadly is, you know, I, I think our users will basically, be, they will be speaking with data and maybe the dashboard becomes almost like a middleman that you, to some extent, get rid of. Now, I do think that you you want to probably have a combination of, say, voice and visuals right when you're when you're doing this so i don't think you're going to eliminate the visual component uh, completely because vision is the highest resolution sense that we humans have but fast and fluid interfaces is the second pillar and the third pillar is deepening the data mode so this is where for example we use ai to label up addresses at scale right so if you want to find out who's behind an address on a on a blockchain you you have lots of sources out there, but you actually need to read through it. You need to do a bit of inference and reasoning to figure out like this address here belongs to Pantera or it belongs to, you know, uh, Three Arrows Capital or it belongs to Coinbase or Binance or, or whatever entity it is. And so that's one area where we are increasingly making use of AI. We already have, you know, lots of um, algorithmic approaches on that front to label, you know, hundreds of millions of addresses. But AI is obviously one of the one of the tactics we need to use to improve on that front. So yeah, it's not. I mean, when we say generative AI, that I think you're right. That's kind of just a just a part of it. Uh, to me, it's you know AI. Like my background is in AI, and and so I've seen at least like two revolutions since I graduated uh, 14 years ago. Um, and 
And I would say that, you know, I, I kind of, on the one hand, I think the recent advances with GPTs are kind of a game changer and a revolution. On the other hand, it does exist on kind of the trajectory of machine learning and AI that's been happening over the last decades. Um, so so we, we look at AI more broadly. It's not just about generative AI. It's like how to use machine learning models, you know, and of course, GPTs and other recent advances. Yeah, I was on a, um, there was a panel recently that we were on and uh, it was talking about the use of AI across finance. And, and one of the questions in the audience was like, it sounds like everything you talk about with generative AI is a, is a co-pilot or an assistant. And I said, well, yeah, right. well, if yeah. machine learning, machine learning is very fast and most of our clients need to make fast decisions to find anomalies. So machine learning works and has a good ROI. So why do you need to, you don't need to fix what's not broken. So yeah. there's many different ways to use AI and it's the right type of AI for the right vertical that you're looking to solve. Um, yeah. And so it was a very interesting conversation and, and kind of in line with what you're saying. But one of the things you just talked about was the ability that AI gives you to scale. Um, mm -hmm. And I know Nansen's been adding quite a few chains as of late. How yeah. do you think about um, adding on new chains and how you how do you weigh the, um, say the capacity to add new chains versus say going deeper into deeper data sets? And how do you think about that? This is such a good good question. And it's a difficult question, right? Because I think the cop-out answer would be, well, we need to add all the chains so we need to have all the support for all of them. Uh, but I think the reality is like you have You'll limited resources. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you, ha it costs you have a lot of money. It costs a lot. <laughs> that, that, that's exactly right. So you have limited resources. So I think, you know, firstly, you have to figure out what are the chains you actually want to add support for. Like, you can't just say all because obviously, you know, it takes a lot of time to, to add these chains. So, so on that front, like, we are very good at EVM chains, so Ethereum virtual machine chains. That's kind of our uh, our wheelhouse. But we also have, you know, we're working on the non-EVM chains at the moment, and we have added uh, other non-EVM chains in the past. So, um so we have to be smart about, so we, we have built our technology in-house so that we can integrate an EVM chain like in a matter of hours. And then of course there are certain components that have to be added that take more time later. For example, the labeling of addresses, right? That That is actually a component that takes a lot of time um, and you need to do a, quality, a lot of quality assurance and things like that. Uh, and then the other aspect like you, like you touched on is in the trade-off of kind of adding one more chain versus like, making sure that the support you have for an existing chain is really, really good and really, really deep. That's something that you were always having to balance. And I th ultimately it comes back to what users ask for, right? So recently we've had a lot of, it's really interesting actually that many of our users now are natively much more multi-chain than they were like two or three years ago. I think two or three years ago, you could have, you could have maybe advocated that like, Let's just stick with Ethereum. That's it. We're just going to go all in on Ethereum. But I don't think that's, you know, that's not a viable strategy today. And it's very clear because our customers are asking for other chains and deeper support for other chains. So I'll just give you a couple of examples, right? Base, um, Coinbase is mm -hmm. L2. That's a chain that many of our customers have asked, like, when are we getting this feature for Base? When are we going to be able to set smart alerts for Base, right? And so on and so forth. And, and then you just have to put that into your product roadmap and, and put that higher on, up on the list. And maybe that means you have a little bit less engineering bandwidth to add some other layer to. So I think all in all, you basically have to look at it based on what the customers are asking for. And then you also have to take a long-term view on, do you believe that this chain is going to be around in two or three years? Or is it just a short-term pump uh, in interest that you have? So, so that's overall how we're approaching it. Um, I don't think there is a silver bullet. You just have to look at what the customers want and then be thoughtful of and intentional about how you use your resources. Cool. Now, thanks for that. Now, now we're going to get DGen. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, certainly, uh, your customers will be demanding these days a lot of chains that support meme coins. Um, even yeah. large investors like Raul Paul are, you know, he says on his podcast all the time, I'm, I'm all in on Seoul, but I still have like a side pocket for meme coins. Um, <laughs> how does Nansen help their customer base look at the, look at the meme coin casino? Oh yeah, that's such a good question. So I would say that Nansen, um, Nansen should be the best product for meme coins. Now, because we've been focused so much on this migration from Nansen 1 to Nansen 2, 
I will admit that a few months ago, I don't think it necessarily uh, was living up to that. But now where we are with all the new features we've been able to migrate over to Nelson 2 and also the new features we've added. So your ability to screen tokens, search for tokens across all sorts of chains to figure out what tokens the smart money you know, are actually buying in real time to set alerts whenever you know someone is either buying some new token or they're selling some token that you just bought you know an hour ago all of these functionalities are in the product now uh, and that means that nonsense i think at this point in time is the best product to trade uh meme course and it will only get better over the next weeks as we roll out these features that we have we don't have kind of a meme coin section in the product. It's more like meme coins are just another type of token. And overall, if you, you know, the interesting thing about meme coins is that by definition, there's like no fundamentals, right? So you don't need to read about, you know, what are the, what's like the revenue profile of a meme coin. It's just, it's just a coin. And, and the only thing that matters is basically who is buying the coin. And, you know, we have, 300 million plus addresses labeled in our platform that can help you understand who is actually buying, you know, Apu or, you know, uh, truck or, you know, any type of DJ meme coin that just launched. So, um, so I think like it might be kind of a secret weapon at this point in time, like people haven't, maybe not everyone has figured out that you can use Dunstan for meme coin trading, but I think increasingly people are going to realize that this is the best product you can use for meme coins, even if you know you don't see meme coins label uh, mentioned on our on our homepage, on our landing page. But you know it it does actually uniquely fit what you want when you're looking for a meme coin um, intelligence platform. Yeah, cool. That's that's good to hear. That's good to use for meme coins. Um, I think one of the other things that comes up quite often when discussing the topic would be uh, like something like a rug alert being able to identify the, the contracts that might seem a bit dodgy or the coins where the yes. liquidity might not be as stable. Um, that's yes. definitely something that is heavily reliant on on-chain data and that combined with who's buying is going to determine which coin's going up, um, I think. You know, so it, re I think it, 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 it really warms my heart to hear that Bloomberg has DGENs in the, in the team. That's just uh, amazing. <laughs> DGENs are everywhere. Um, <laughs> um, so I guess uh, the next thing, let's just shift back to kind of, I guess, more standard crypto stuff and talk about DeFi. So, De so DeFi is just keeps on growing. And I just wanted to talk briefly about um, the kind of analytics that Nansen's offering across the DeFi space. Yeah. So, you know, DeFi... Um... You can look at that in a few different ways. Obviously, most DeFi protocols will have governance tokens, right? So being able to track who is buying the different governance tokens and so on is very important. And so looking that up. In addition, you know, we have some uh, bespoke dashboards in our product for some of the larger DeFi protocols like Lido, for example, which is, you know, in terms of TVL, the largest um, DeFi protocol out there with I think it's 29, maybe it's more now with the price of ETH going up, but it should be above $30 billion um, in value locked, right, in Lido. Uh, Eigenlayer is also, that's the second one, right, which is about half of the TVL of Lido. And we have been working uh, on Eigenlayer data as well. We we haven't released it yet, but that's something that's that the team is looking at. Um, and then I think, you know, be, beyond that, you know, it's it's really if you look at the different chains that we support now, you can see what are the most used projects or protocols. And this is actually a you know many people know Nelson as a paid product, but we actually ha have free dashboards as well uh, uh, as part of the product. And if you go into the different blockchains we support, you can see all the top entities that people are 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 using. So. An example of this, the other day I was looking at base and now Uniswap is basically, you know, maybe not surprisingly, like the most used protocol uh, on base, right? So so being able to track like how many users are using Uniswap and so on, you can do, do nonsense as well. And then finally, we, we also have people who want to kind of create their own bespoke dashboards and do their own bespoke analyses. And so 
you know, all the data we have for all these different chains, uh, enterprises and crypto teams can also basically get access to that through a product that's called Nonsense Query. And so this is where, you know, you could be creating your own dashboards for your own organization or any specific ecosystem or sector that you're interested in. Uh, and we work with quite a few clients there who have their own like private dashboards uh, that track uh, what's happening in the DeFi space. Cool. And then we have only a few minutes left, so I'm not going to um, sit here and ask another question about the analytics or Nen Center on-chain data. We're going to get into a bit of just kind of your own personal views about the sector. Um, mm -hmm. I heard Mark Cuban say a long time ago in an interview that, you know, when he was starting internet companies in the 90s when we were in high school, he was, uh, no one knew what the problem the internet was going to solve till the problem got solved. And then once it got solved is when all the value got created. And that, in his view, you know, crypto has been trying to find that problem to solve for a very long time. And, and he's not, and he's confident in that it will solve something. And he just needs to find that problem to solve. So I think that we saw ICO pipeline, we saw a big ICO boom many years back. We saw the X to earn summer. We see the, DeFi summer, I think you might say this might be coming into like a layer two or real world asset year this year. I guess in your mind, um, when you talk to people, <clears throat> what do you think is the the next kind of thing that crypto can look to try to solve? And of the things that crypto has already been trying to create solutions for, what do you think are the most relevant things that it can try and solve for? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll uh, sort of address the second part of your question first, right? I, I do think that for example, stable coins are such an obvious use case and mm -hmm. has like proven product market fit with blockchains, right? The, no one no one is forcing you to put dollars on chain, but it seems to be happening like at scale, $150 billion worth of, you know, US dollars on chain. And the continuation of that is, you know, what many people think of as real world assets. You could argue that stable coins are, or US dollars are the first real world assets to come on chain. And so you're seeing more than a billion dollars worth of tokenized treasuries on chain now, many different protocols and providers doing that. And I think that's just going to continue. And at some point you get real estate and all these different things too, but you kind of need to take one asset class at a time and you start with the ones that are the easiest to, to tokenize. Um, if we think more about, so that's like, that's a very obvious one in my opinion. And that's going to, that actually goes into you know, if you think really far into the future, we're talking like literally hundreds of trillions of dollars of, of value, right? If you think of real estate as an asset class and so on. Um, but uh, but but if we if we think of more kind of unique uh, use cases, right? Then I I've said this a lot, but I think Web three gaming makes a lot of sense, and uh, and I think it's literally starting now. Uh, Web three gaming season. You're seeing games come to market now that have already like hundreds of thousands of players. You're just probably going to reach millions of players. So I, I think the the X to earn or like the second version of that is actually going to play out, taking the lessons learned from that first version. You don't get it right the first time, but I do think that gaming just makes a ton of sense for blockchain, for crypto, and digital assets. Um, yeah, And then there's like a ton of other things probably that we could talk about. But like the whole like DeFi and DEXs and so on, my view is that if every asset gets tokenized, then ultimately DEXs and DeFi are going to become enormous, right? In terms of the total wrestle market. Um, and Uniswap's market share versus Coinbase, I think it's a super interesting metric to look at from 2019 to today. And you can see how much Uniswap has grown. And that's a testament to blockchains actually being useful, in my opinion. But yeah, so those are some of my thoughts. Cool. Thank you very much. Well, we've come to the end of our time here. Um, Alex, thank you so much for your time telling us about <clears throat> Nansen and how they're using on-chain analytics can help enhance our investment experience. Um, yeah. And thanks everyone for listening in and look forward to catching up again soon. Thanks, Michael.